worthy successor that not just matched their RPG greatness, but surpassed it. And it's easy to spend a lot of time in a relatively small area just because of how much stuff is going on. But before long, it becomes apparent that Baldur's Gate 3 allows players to be the authors of their own destinies in a way no other game has before. So, I don't know about you guys, but for that whole month, this was every conversation I had about video games with everybody I knew, even though I never once asked about Baldur's Gate 3. I have played Dungeons & Dragons in real life exactly once. My group didn't know what we were doing, and after three hours, I think we advanced through two battles and the survivors died to traps in the next room. I could see the appeal, but it wasn't for me. So when everybody and their 20-sided dice started hammering my eardrums with talk of an epic digital version of this legendary board game, I wondered if perhaps this was what I needed to bridge the gap between my wanting to enjoy the experience and actually being able to. After 12 hours of barely scratching the surface of this obviously extremely well-made game, I can tell you that no, it was not. There was an immediate sense of deja vu, when dice rolls didn't go in my favour and many turns felt wasted. There was certainly a lot that I did appreciate about the game. It's stunning to look at with great voice acting and interesting writing, and I will never not love being able to have a chat with an actual bear. Just a moment. This man is recording my story. But something about it just wasn't resonating with me. Now, it seems almost redundant to point out that not every person is going to enjoy every type of game. I cannot think of a power on this earth that will ever be able to make me play a sports game, and despite my love for the Persona franchise, the number of f**ks I give about their spin-off dance games will never rise above zero. But when a game is universally acclaimed and hailed as an unmissable masterpiece, surely that changes things, right? Perhaps I had missed something, and wasn't playing it in a way best suited to me. Maybe if I had just stuck with it a bit longer, Perhaps I would have had a light bulb moment and been able to pick up what all my friends were putting down. You see, the thing is, this isn't the first time this has happened to me. Despite several attempts and dozens of hours invested, I have never been able to fully get into universally acclaimed masterpieces like Red Dead Redemption 2 or The Witcher 3. This is something I've thought about a lot lately, as I'm coming into the later stages of my backlog project, and some of these seminal games have been peeking out at me from the bottom of the pile. Do I write them off, or do I try again? Why exactly didn't these games work for me the first, second, or even third time around? I just thought you might have moved on by now. You want me to move on? No, no, not at all. I just I know you can run it alone, no problem. So first up, let's start with something I've alluded to already. Maybe the problem is that I just needed to stick with the game a bit longer. If you were raised in the 80s or 90s, then there's a strong chance you were brought up to follow a lot of the same rules that I was, chief among them that you never quit when it gets tough. Boomer parent mentality can be summed up by any training montage from literally any 80s film that had one. However good intention this advice was at the time, most of us now know it's just as important to work smart and walk away from things that aren't working. But when exactly is that point? One of my favourite games of the 8th console generation is Dragon Age Inquisition, but on my first playthrough it took roughly 7 hours before things started falling into place and I actually started to truly enjoy the game. Back then it was pretty much the only game I had to play at the time, and it was a Valentine's gift, so it was pretty much guaranteed that I was going to see it through. But if you ask me now to invest 7 hours into a game before I enjoy it, you would really have to sell me on the payoff. You have to stick with it. It gets good so many hours in. These are things I hear a lot when people recommend games on the larger end of the scale. The thing is, I really don't agree with this design principle. I appreciate most large and complex games want to break you in slowly and establish themselves, but why do so many games elect to stick to the same boring formula? You open with some kind of cool, high-stakes, story-focused prologue section before completely switching tone, abandoning any urgency, and dumping you into a generic open area with little to no direction. 
I appreciate wanting to cut right to the freedom and exploration, but come on, is it so hard to change things up a bit? Do we always need to start Frodo off in the Shire? <laughs> Persona 5, Horizon Zero Dawn, GTA 5, God of War, Trails of Cold Steel, and most recently, and very much to my pleasant surprise, Stella Blade. All examples of games that open strong, break you in slowly, but also keep things interesting and hook you right away. The first time I played each of these games, I played for a minimum of three hours, because I was hooked from the start, not because I was trying to stick with them. But I digress. Not every design choice that compels me is going to compel everyone else, so this is subjective. However, a game taking a long time to get good is absolutely something that can be a blocker to you being able to get that game. You don't even have to be older for this one. The more you game, the more you will experience. The more you will see games change, for the better and for the worse. The more you will start to recognize patterns, repeated failings, and what qualifies as a well-made game, and what does and doesn't make the cut for you. Let's look at the Dark Souls games. They are a prime example of deep and complex games, with layers upon layers of varied systems to challenge you more than most games do. However, at no time is any of this presented to you in a way that is not crisp, clean and efficient. The lore is famously obtuse, of course, but everything else, the stats, the menus, the explanations, they're all easily accessible at any time. The UI is clear and it lets you focus on the action, even with multiple things to keep track of. The controls are incredibly precise. Once you've experienced a game presented to you like this, you might find you have very little patience for games with seven different meters between the top and middle of the screen to keep track of during a boss fight. This unfortunately brings me to Red Dead Redemption 2. It breaks my heart that I have never been able to get into this game beyond the opening hours. It is absolutely stunning. The voice acting is top notch and I was so engrossed in every conversation held on horseback that it wasn't until afterwards I realized I was likely just watching mass loading times. But on the other hand, the controls are clunky, hardly anything feels intuitive, and on top of everything else, you have to feed yourself and your horse. Easy girl, you're okay. <laughs> Maybe Red Dead 2 isn't the best example, because I haven't fully given up on this one yet, but the point remains that it felt like it was making me work harder than it should. I really cannot overstate how much I hate nourishment mechanics. I firmly believe they should be optional in any game they appear in. They were also one of two reasons why I gave up on Tears of the Kingdom. I really did not appreciate that cooking food was basically a requirement to restore Link's health. I don't know if I missed something here, but why couldn't they include a standard health item, but then tie the food to bonuses or something? It was so immersion breaking to have to stop to forage for and then cook apples every hour or so because I needed restorative items. The second cardinal sin Zelda committed was all of the weapons breaking so frequently. I appreciate this is to encourage you to use your magic arm to make new ones, but for God's sake Nintendo, this felt like it was happening every two or three enemies, and every time it was immersion breaking. I'm still very salty about this because I loved everything else about Tears of the Kingdom, but these two mechanics made it feel like I was happily driving along and someone was frequently slamming the handbrake on. When I was younger, it didn't matter how good or bad a game was. If that's what I had to play that day, then I would figure it out. I figured out that god-awful card game in Final Fantasy IX, so I'm sure back then I would have had no problem getting used to the flirty, janky way that Geralt moves about. Whatever your personal peeves are with game design, they can very easily be a barrier for entry, no matter how much you might love other aspects of the game. I've referenced the Souls games here purely for how lovely their user interface is, but they are of course also famously very hard, and for millions of gamers, this is the barrier for entry. 
A clean UI means nothing to you if the tutorial boss keeps bitch slapping you across the map. Personal peeves are just that, personal. But whatever they are, they can absolutely stop you from being able to get that game. No, that's all I have to say besides, and I really mean this. Moo. When you boil down a lot of what we've just covered, it comes down to preference. What is and isn't going to hold or repel your interest? So now the question becomes, do you want to walk away from the games you don't get, or do you want to find a way to advance? We only get so much time on this earth, and for many of us, we don't get to spend all that much of it doing the things that we want to do. I've said it before, and I will never stop saying it, hobbies and passions are supposed to be fun, a distraction from real life. Whether a game just isn't working for you, or it's just not working for you right now, it is okay to stop playing. We all have those moments in life where something changes, and suddenly, a weight is lifted that you didn't even know you were carrying. Usually these moments are when we step off a plane on the first day of a holiday, but the point remains. It really is okay to say no to a game. Ah, you're addressing me? A humble ox. How quaint. Now, on the other hand, let's say you want to persevere. You want to find a way to push through and actually enjoy the game that's giving you trouble. Well, okay then, because I have a few suggestions for this also. First up, if you're not enjoying how a game feels to control, why not look at the settings? I found a very interesting Reddit post that listed a whole bunch of suggested changes to the Red Dead Redemption 2 control scheme. So I tried it out for myself, and I am thrilled to report that it has made a huge difference, and I am tentatively enjoying myself a lot more this time. I will of course link the Reddit post in the description. Another helpful tip I've found is to have some kind of connection to the source material. The Witcher 3 saw a massive spike in players after the Netflix series came out, so that one speaks for itself really. I am a huge fan of Cobra Kai, but the tie-in game was just awful. It's like 10 years behind what Streets of Rage was 30 years ago, but my love for the series kept me playing a good few hours longer than I otherwise would have. Hey, where do you think you're going, boys? Tori, we're kicking some ass. Join us. Let's say you really want to get into a game, but you're finding the difficulty to be much too steep. My recommendation there, from extensive personal experience, is to watch someone else play it. You will not only see that it can be done, but also that it likely isn't as tough as you thought it was. For Souls games, and to be fair, any difficult game really, I highly recommend Fighting Cowboy. If it were not for this man, I don't think I'd have ever gotten the hang of Sekiro. And my final tip is series or franchise loyalty. Stranger of Paradise is an average Souls-like wrapped up in a convoluted bag of weirdness, but I am a lifelong Final Fantasy fan. I was so excited to see how each level tied into one of the numbered entries. I didn't care that the story got all weird, I just loved that they were trying to flesh out the bare bones plot of the original. Did I play the DLC? It had Bahamut, and Gilgamesh, and the Warrior of Light, you bet your ass I did. Was it any good? No, of course not. But I was wearing my happy nostalgia goggles, so who cares? And bring the world once more into light. Jed. I place the future of Cornelia in your hands. We now know there are a laundry list of valid reasons why games that seemingly everyone else adores won't make the cut for you. And that is okay. If you want to walk away from them, that is okay too. It is okay to stop. But if you want to give them another try, now at least you have some ideas about what you can potentially try a little differently. Control schemes can be altered, walkthroughs can be consulted, and to put my money where my mouth is, I could always Google what food or recipes are easiest to make, and which weapons have longer durability. Whatever you decide, always try to remember, it's just a game, and they're supposed to be fun. Thank you as always for watching and supporting my channel, you guys. Even though I am pivoting more towards video essays now, I am still working on my Relax Backlog Challenge, and you can follow my progress using the link in the description. Let me know if there were any super popular games that you couldn't get into. I know I'm not alone on this one. Take care of yourselves out there. See you on the next one.